Hey guys, my name is Gloria and welcome back to my channel and my October videos special to celebrate the, the spooky season. Uh, we've just gone down to uh, level 5, or gone up to level 5 lockdown in Ireland, so I shall not be leaving the house for at least 6 weeks pretty much, so plenty of time to read, plenty of time to get into authors that I wouldn't normally have gotten into. So. Speaking of which, uh, today I want to talk about a couple of writers that I feel like I should have read before. Um, they're sort of big names uh, that I've heard a lot about but I never actually got around to reading them so I figured let's get into some old big name writers. Uh, so today I want to talk about Ray Bradbury and Sheridan Le Fanu. So for Ray Bradbury today I read Something Wicked This Way Comes which I picked that because um, apparently he's he wrote a lot in his lifetime. Um, he wrote over 500 short stories, novels, novellas, scripts, poems, um, but Something Wicked This Way Comes, a uh, great title first of all, great cover, really spooked me and uh, it was termed by quite a few people as being one of his best works so I thought what a good place to start. Uh, for Sheridan Le Fanu, I read In the Glass Darkly, uh, which is this. I bought it for four euro at Hodges Vegas apparently. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee I only bought it because there's cool oil on the front, but still a good buy. Um, so In the Glass Darkly is a set of short stories, almost novellas, um, that are almost all, I think, um, from the perspective of a certain character of his, a doctor, um, who had strange cases he had to look into and it's, it's the account of those cases and this is one of his best works as well. So first I want to talk about Ray Bradbury and Something Wicked This Way Comes. So Something Wicked This Way Comes was released in 1962 and it follows the story of two 13 year old boys and their misadventures with the traveling carnival that comes to their town. It's Jim Nightshade, the darker one, and William Holloway, the more naive innocent one, but they are best friends and they discover this carnival and they're very intrigued by it and there's some strange, evil, weird, creepy characters um, with it and they start to notice some strange things happening and they get caught up in this carnival trying to come after them for them knowing um, the the darker side to this carnival so they start being followed, they start being followed by the strange people slash creatures that are involved in this uh, but it's not just to do with the two boys, it also integrates uh, William's father in this. So Jim lives with his mother, he's never known his father, uh, they live directly beside each other and Will lives with his mother and father and his father is quite a bit older than other other dads um, with kids his age. Uh, he's in his 50s and he feels like he's too old to really have a son that young and he feels like he can't really relate to him, he can't play with him like other dads would and there's a large rift between the two of them because they feel so disjointed and Will's father spends most of his time um, in the library. He's a janitor there and he goes there even at night he can see across the town and he can see the lights on in the library and he knows that that's where his dad is because he's not very happy at home and it the story integrates these two boys trying to figure out how to get out of the trap that they've been enticed into. The relationship between those boys, the relationship between growing up, staying young, um, losing innocence. Uh, it seems that Jim may have already lost some of his innocence but Will is clinging on to his and also the relationship between um, the father and son in that equation as well. I really enjoy the book. I thought it was fantastical. It's perfect for Halloween. Uh, the carnival shows up in their town just before Halloween. It's an absolute perfect spooky read for October so if you're looking for those go for it. Um, it's sort of a great study in characters and in setting up a story. Um, I saw a lot of Stephen King in 
in this story. Um, obviously Stephen King talks a lot about Ray Bradbury, so does Neil, uh, Neil Gaiman. That's partly where I heard the name and I can see where Stephen King got a lot of his his ideas for how to work in characters and how to build up characters and stuff from this. Um, it's written sort of over the top. It's quite flowery language. It's quite... There's a lot of great imagery and metaphors used, but I think he knows what he's doing with it. Obviously he'd been writing for a long time by then, but he knows what he's doing with it. He knows when to pull back a little and it never felt too too rich or anything. You still got completely the whole story and it, I think he has a great way of of building imagery in in the story and to parallel that with the sort of the comments he wanted to make about aging and losing your innocence and the wish for a lot of the characters in this to be different ages. There are older people who want to be younger, there are younger people who want to be older, um, everyone just kind of wants something that they can't have and this carnival promises uh, a lot of things that it can't deliver. Uh, but I really love the story. Um, I wasn't expecting to actually get chills or anything but there is a particular witchy character in the story that tries to find out where the boys are living and she floats over their houses in an air balloon um, and it is just really creepy. I was really uncomfortable for that whole time that that was happening, that that scene was happening and it just weirded me out and uh, I was delighted by that so that was great. Uh, the main character, the main sort of owner of the carnival is called Mr. Dark and I think he was supposed to be a lot, um, a lot edgier, a lot more sinister than he was. I didn't find him very sinister. I find um, some of the other characters a lot more sinister than he was, but he was sort of the ringleader of it. Um, Ray Bradbury seems to have a thing for tattoos, um, and I realised then as well that he wrote uh, The Illustrated Man. I've seen the movie of that very weird but um, he seems to have a thing about tattoos and Mr. Dark is covered in tattoos and the way it's written it's always written as though he's coming along with a crowd of onlookers because there are so many faces and stuff on his skin so that was really interesting really well written the relationship between the boys is uh, so sweet and also heartbreaking because you have Will who is so you know they're both 13 year old boys, they get up to mischief and whatnot, they're messing with people, but there's a point very all, very early on in the book where uh, Jim knows that there's a house where you can look in the window and there are naked people. I don't know if it's some sort of swingers thing or something, but he is very intrigued by this and he wants to go back to that house and he wants to see them again and he's sort of on the verge of puberty, I suppose, but will. Will's not anywhere near as interested. He doesn't want to go back there. He thinks it's weird. He doesn't really want to see that yet. And it's sort of the the push and pull between both of those that Jim really wants to grow up. He wants to be older. He wants to get out in the world. And he's a lot more pushed down, I suppose, by the world. He can he can easily see um, people do, doing bad things, he can totally believe that happening. Will is a little, bo a little bit more on the naive side. He doesn't really want to believe that people do bad things and it's just, it's sort of heartbreaking because you can see Will start to realise that at some point Jim is going to leave him behind. He's going to either literally get older than him and leave him behind or he's going to just drift away and they're going to be very different people when they're older. Um, the relationship between Will and his father as well is similarly heartbreaking. Um, his father's not happy at all. He never thought that he would be happy and then he met his wife and they had a child and he's still not really happy. He, he feels he's too old to have a son this young and he can't really be a great father because of this. Um, but he does get him into a lot of books and a lot of reading and a lot of adventures and he's he ends up being very supportive of him as a father and ends up really helping out um, to to get back at these uh, 
spooky carnival people to um, get them out of the town and I think Bradbury just has a great way of bringing these characters together. Um, it's written over such a short period of time, I think pretty much they're gone in about six days or so, but a lot happens and the boys do a lot and there's a lot of creepy, spooky people and sort of secondary characters who kind of get pulled into all this mess and I just really loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was really well written. I thought um, he really worked well with the purple prose and stuff. You know, you can have flowery language um, as long as you balance it out with with real, real action and real actual happenings and stuff and I think Bradbury it's obviously skilled at that and uh, this is a great fantastic read for the spooky season and because he's written so many other things uh, I already have Fahrenheit 451 in my Kindle library so there's plenty more to enjoy from Ray Bradbury so on to Sheridan Le Fanu um, I was sort of planning on so this is an Irish writer Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu uh, he is an Irish writer, uh, grew up in Dublin. I was sort of planning on going to the streets because the streets that he was born in and lived on, um, they're in Dublin, so are Oscar Wilde's and uh, Bram Stoker as well, so I wanted to maybe get a couple of shots of those, but, you know, global pandemic. Shouldn't really be outside wandering past people, so I decided against that, but um, it was very cool. I, I picked up this book had no idea who Le Fanu was, I think it was last year, and obviously I thought French name, um, he definitely has French ancestors, but he was uh, born and grew up in Ireland, and this is one of his most famous collections. When you look him up on Wikipedia, you can see that he had a huge influence on other Gothic writers of the time, um, especially American ones, and Henry James was a huge fan of his. There is a lot uh, of evidence that he possibly was a great influence on Bram Stoker writing Dracula. Um, so the Dr. Hazelius uh, is the person who's dealing with all the cases in this collection and there's a lot of evidence that Hazelius was an influence on Van Helsing. But the main one is the last story in this collection and it's called Carmilla and it is about a female vampire and there is the story isn't um isn't similar to dracula at all but it came out before dracula there were a lot of moments in it and sort of descriptions that did give you a feel of bram stoker's story uh it's interesting as well it's one of the few and i would have been quite shocked uh, if I hadn't read the introduction going into this, but uh, in the introduction it is mentioned that um, this is a female vampire who seems to go after young ladies of a similar age to herself. So it's a young 20-something looking vampire who seems to really like 20-something young women. Um, so it's, there's undertones of lesbianism in it, which was quite odd at the time. I'm sure it was sort of put in to, to add to the bizarreness of it and the otherworldliness of it and um, it's, it's stated in the introduction as well that some people think that because the character she's after is sort of putting off her advances um, that it was, it was seen as okay but um, it is very interesting to read something from so long ago that has a lesbian vampire in it to be honest but um but there's quite a few stories in this um a few of them i discovered i actually had read before um green tea i think i read in college um i'm not sure i'm not entirely sure but i definitely remembered it uh so green tea is the story of a man who he is a pastor he is um a minister in a church and all of a sudden he develops some strange ailment that stops him from speaking in church. He's in the middle of sermons and he has to just stop and leave and he can't do it anymore. This will happen a few times and then he goes away to try and get better. He'll come back but keeps happening and this Dr. Zelius 
comes to him and tries to look into his case. Uh, it turns out this man is very into his green tea, uh, which seems innocuous, you know, it's just, it's tea. It's uh, some kind of stimulant, but it's fine. Uh, but it turns out that this green tea has, as they describe it in the story, um, sort of stimulants or crutches that people use, like coffee or tobacco or whatever, can invite demons into your life. And this man has invited a demon in the form of a small monkey into his life. And it doesn't like when he reads from the Bible, it doesn't like when he says his prayers. Uh, it doesn't seem to have any, it's always just around him, it will show up, it'll leave for a while, he thinks he's safe, and then it'll just be there in the room with him. Um, it sort of throws tantrums and gets really angry whenever he tries to say prayers and stuff. It sounds a little bit farcical and um, funny whenever you describe it, but it is written in such a way that it is sinister and, and weird and just this dark shape of this monkey that is clearly demonic and it's it actually begins with red eyes so we start to see red eyes following him around which is creepy in itself and it materializes as this little monkey demon that uh is hellbent on getting him to give up his faith pretty much so that one is creepy and i'm very glad i don't drink green tea um another one in particular that really again i wasn't expecting to be so creeped out by this uh but there's a story called the familiar and it is about a young man who falls in love with a young woman and they are waiting for her father to get back from india so that he can give a blessing to the wedding but they're pretty much they're pretty much engaged they're gonna get married uh and he starts to be stalked by a <clears throat> by the dark shape of a small and sinister man and he, it starts with just footsteps following him. He can hear them running at him and stopping as he's on his way back from his girlfriend's house. And it's got this sort of slow build that really just freaks you out and you're not, you do believe because other people do see this man, you do believe that it is a real man, but you're not entirely sure if it's some sort of a manifestation of something. Uh, you do get the impression that he is in some way guilty of something and there is something weighing heavy on him that is creating this sinister presence in his life and there are a few times where this shape, this face of this man and the way he's described is he's a small man but he's, his face is like distorted with anger and hatred and he's just so dark and sinister uh, and there's a few times where he just shows up unexpectedly and even scares other people. It's not even just the main guy he's scaring. And this man is so affected by this that he eventually gets very sick. He has to stay in bed. He's neglecting his uh, girlfriend as well. And she gets a bird as a pet. And it seems that this darkness also manifests, manifests itself in her pet. And she loves this bird but this bird hates him and he hates the bird and it doesn't have a super happy ending because it is gothic tale but uh, that one as well in particular really creeped me out. Um, I think if you're looking for some new um, gothic stories to read from the 1800s, I think it's the 1800s. This was uh, first published in 1872 so if you're looking for another great gothic writer, if you've read Poe, if you've read Henry James, if you've read Dracula by Bram Stoker, um, if you've read those books and you want some new gothic stories to read, uh, something a little bit different perhaps, but with just the same amount of bite and the same amount of really creepy images that get stuck in your brain, your brain, your brain, your mind, um, I would definitely recommend Sheridan Le Fanu, another great Irish writer, uh, and In a Glass Darkly. I can't believe that was only four quid, that is such a good buy, but, um, so it was another stellar, well, last week wasn't great because I didn't really like Dean Coons, but I think this was, uh, a great shout for me. I'm really glad that I read Bradbury and Le Fanu and that I... What's happening with my voice? 
that I got these uh, great stories under my belt now that I've read them and I can recommend them to other people. So if you've read any Bradbury or Le Fanu before, if you have any recommendations based on these, please let me know. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for liking and subscribing. And for all the people who've been commenting on, under my videos, um, it's great to sort of get recommendations and chat about stuff and whatnot. So thank you so much for interacting. I shall be back tomorrow with another fun time video. And it will be tomorrow because I have plenty of time to do things now. Um, so got plenty of videos planned still for the next week or so. I'm just going to try and enjoy being here and enjoy some spooky things. So thank you so much for watching and joining me here and I shall see you in the next video. You can now read my shirt and you can go.